couple things for you. One, uh, you need to know that we are having our farewell as a family as for our 12 years. You know, I've, I've been officially preaching and been the pastor of this church today for 12 years. How about that? And, uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's with a bittersweet sort of next step that we take. Obviously, like, the bitter part is it's been 12 years of awesome love and support from our church, and it's been great to be used by God in this community, and we've loved every second of it. Uh, but the sweet part is we know where God's leading us next, and that is back to the place where we have family that we are going to plug into for the rest of, uh, of time, I'm hoping. You know, who knows? We'll see what God does next. But, um, yeah, so the fourth is going to be our, our farewell service here, and I uh, just want you to be prepared for that. It's going to be fun. I don't know how it's going to be fun, but we're going to make it fun, because uh, if it's sad and boring, I'm out. I'm only doing one of these. Right? Yeah, free, the second service won't get it, so that's not happening. It'll just be a time of prayer or something like that. But um, yeah, so that's coming up. Just be, be prepared for that. Uh, so today we're going to continue a, a series we started a couple weeks ago where we're talking about what does it mean for us to be growing in our faith, to becoming spiritual adults rather than infants, all right? Infants um, need others to feed them. It's very important. They need sustenance from out the outside. They need external support and growth. It's very important. And every one of us, when we began our journey with God, we needed others to lead us and teach us and to provide for us and to show us the right way. But there needs to come a place in all of our lives where we desire to move from being infants into being adults, into being the kinds of people in our walk with God where we are not just being fed, but we turn and feed others. Where we are happy to pick up the fork ourselves. All right? And we're digging into God's word. We're digging into what he's doing in our world. We're welcoming the work of the Spirit in our lives. And we are engaging with God and growing in our faith so that we are now able to help others rather than just be fed. Right? That's essential for us. So today we're going to be talking about one of the most essential elements to what it means to be a spiritual adult. And that is our, our communication, our prayer, all right? our connection with God. We're going to be focusing on a teaching that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples, and his disciples came to him in this circumstance and asked him to explain how he approaches the Father. How does he pray? How does he communicate with the Father? So we're going to start, we're going to be in Luke chapter 11, looking at verse 1. We're going to start there. We're going to bounce around a little bit in different places, but we're going to keep returning into Luke. So Luke 11:1 1 says, one day, Jesus was, pre was praying in a certain place. Okay, so stop there. You can see that Jesus was modeling the concept. He was spending time with the Father in a dedicated way. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Okay, let's unpack that for a second. Okay, the first thing here that I always wonder when I read something like this is, why is there a need for Jesus to teach us how to pray, right? Because most of us, we, if I were to ask you, define prayer for me, you know, you'd probably say things that I've said many, many times, which is prayer is very simple. It's just your communication with God. You know, you just talk to God, right? And on one level, that's true. But on another level, that only leads us to a place where we're constantly talking about us, our needs, our wants, our desires. It's all about me telling God all the things that I think God should be doing in life. Right? And that's, that's a, a one-sided conversation. And so obviously there was something in the way that Jesus was communicating with the Father that was different from what we assume prayer looks like. And this idea where it says, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray, where does that come from? Well, probably nine out of the 12 of Jesus' original disciples, these apostles, nine out of 12 of them had at one point been under the influence of John the Baptist. They were a part of his preaching, part of his teaching. They were, they were with him at one point. And Jesus comes along, if you remember, and John says, behold, the Lamb of God who, who's come to take away the sins of the world. John says, I must become less, he must become more. And that's when those disciples turned and followed Jesus after that point. And so they're coming to Jesus and saying, not so much, Jesus, give us a prayer. Right? Give us a prayer that we can memorize and use over and over and over. 
What they're saying is, do what we saw John do. Help us to understand what you do. Help us to see your, your approach. How do you relate to God? Right? We, we call that prayer. But the reality is, that this, is a, this is a communion with God. This is an open-ended conversation, a relationship with God. There was something different about the way that Jesus related to the Father. And they were saying to Jesus, show us that. Help us to understand what you're doing when you're in this time of communication. And so it's into that context that Jesus gives the teaching. He gives this idea of this prayer that we pick up in verse 2 to 4. It said, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Now, even if this is your first time in church, and if so, congratulations, I'm glad you're here. You've probably heard something about the Lord's Prayer in your life through movies, through TV shows. I mean, it's used in horror movies. So, I mean, it's it's out there. It's everywhere. And for those of you that know the Lord's Prayer well, and you could say it off the top of your head, you're probably listening to Luke's version and going, that's not right. All right. There's stuff missing in what we just read. Why didn't he give the whole prayer? Yeah, agreed. It's shorter than the version that's given to us in Matthew chapter 6. And before you come up with conspiracy theories and you start accusing Luke of changing things, You need to step back and remember the context into which Jesus spoke. He wasn't giving a memorized prayer. Do this one prayer. He was responding to their request. Show us, give us your yoke. Give us your understanding. Give us your approach to God. How do you relate to the Father? And so Jesus is showing them this is how you pray. You pray like this. And so it begins with this statement. It begins with Father hallowed be your name, right? Hallowed be your name. None of us use the word hallowed in regular conversation. You show up to the office and in these hallowed halls, right? Unless you work at Hogwarts, that's not happening, right? Or, or maybe you've been to the MCG and you're like, on these hallowed grounds. You know, we don't use that language. And when we do, often what we mean is stuff has happened here. Big stuff has happened in this spot. This is a hallowed place. We don't really understand what it means, but we kind of get the gist. And that's okay, but it's not great. You know what would be great was to know what the word actually means. So guess what? (laughs) It's going to be a bit of that, all right? So let's look at the Greek word. All right, we got to do it. We got to do it. All right, so the Greek word for hallowed here is hagiadso, right? So... If you've ever heard of the, the uh, ha, oh my gosh, the Sophia, the Hagia Sophia, the, the big building that's no longer called that. That's why it's a bit of a struggle. Um, you know, this, this word is often used to describe the concept of holiness. Uh, it's used to describe the idea of sanctification. What, those are two big religious words. What do they mean? Well, what this is saying is that the Lord God Almighty, the God of creation, the Father that Jesus is praying to, Okay, that the Father is separate, is not like the rest of us. That nothing can compare to the Father. The Father can't be compared to anything. Nothing is like God. Do you understand that, right? When we talk about the holiness of God, God is wholly other. We, we resemble him, we're made in his image, but he is not like us and we are not like him. Now, you might think that's weird. I don't normally think like that about God. I think of God as being my best pal. He's just like me. He's everything like me. That's because we're limited in our understanding, and we can't comprehend the holiness, righteousness, and sanctified nature of the living God. But in this prayer, we are being challenged, being called to see that God is not like us. He is not broken like us. He is not weak like us. He is not limited in his understanding and knowledge like we are. God is wholly other. Hallowed be your name is a great approach in prayer. It's where we start in our relationship with God. It's where we begin in this time of prayer. We're seeing seeing that we have been 
We are praying to the Lord who is set apart, who is different. But beyond that, you might think that makes God feel distant and cold and separate from you. But the reality is that, that that's the work that Jesus Christ has done in us as he has brought us into the presence of God. Though we don't belong there, we don't, we don't deserve to be in this holy and righteous nature. We don't belong to be a part of this one who is separate from us. Jesus Christ makes us into his image and delivers us into the presence of the living God. This is what is said explicitly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. It says this, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. Right? Hagiazo, it's the same word. Sanctify you, set you apart, make you holy and other. May he sanctify you through and through, every part of you. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, that's through and through, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God himself is hallowed and holy and separate. He is other than, and yet he loves us so much that through the work of Jesus Christ, he carries us from our place of brokenness and our place of need, our place of corruption, into his place of perfection. We are united with Christ. We are like him for eternity. Not because of our works, but because of his love, his choice to include us into his presence. That is what it means. When we pray this prayer, we are acknowledging who God is and what that means for us. How can you, right? How can you, a broken, sinful human being, ever pretend to demand the ear of the righteous God, the Holy One of Israel, the one who was, is, and is to come? We are nothing but dust. Right? We, are the, we are thoughts of God. He spoke and we exist. How can we ever claim to demand anything of the Lord and yet God chooses to bring us into his nature, into his presence, into his being through the work of Jesus Christ? When we pray, hallowed is your name, we're not just saying you've got a good name. We're saying we are included in you through the work of Christ. You are wholly other and different and now we too are joined in your righteousness. That's a good way to start a prayer. When you start prayer with your list of needs, wants, and desires, or God forbid, your accusations against God, God, where are you? Why are you not listening? Why aren't you responding? When we start with, with a focus on me, 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 we're missing out on an incredible first step in a relationship where Jesus says it's about you, 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 you. That's where we should begin in prayer, according to Jesus. Next thing he says is three little words. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. This is, again, a reminder that we, as the creation, are in service of the creator, not the other way around. Right? That we are here to not build up our kingdom, to make our name great, to exalt ourselves over others, but instead to submit ourselves to God and to allow God to use us to build his name, his kingdom, and his greatness. It's a submission, my will being submitted to the will of God. It's about more than just, yeah, God, do your thing. Now, in one way, this is an incredibly freeing and incredibly awesome gift because most of us don't feel like our lives are filled with eternal purpose on a daily basis. Right? I mean, if you're a young mom at home, you've got babies, how many nappies have you changed? Right? There's not a lot of eternal purpose in that. You know, I've done it, been there, don't want to go back. You know, when you go to the office and, and it's like, how many millions of emails have I responded to in my lifetime? Oh, here's another one. Here's somebody else that wants to take a piece of me. Here's something else that's coming along. It's hard to see the eternal purpose in your life at times. And here we're being given an opportunity to take all that we are, our work, our studies, our body, our family, our relationships, everything that we are in life, and to submit them to the king. And to say to the king, God, use me to build your kingdom. 
Because as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not on earth. It's not built of physical things. But God is using us as we submit ourselves to him to build his kingdom. That means the, the temporary in our life is actually eternal. That means sometimes the meaningless junk that we feel like we've got to go through in life, if we submit it to Christ and we worship God through our emails and through our helping others and through the way that we treat the people around us, if we worship God through all these things, they become meaningful and eternal. This was, again, explicitly said through the Apostle Paul. I'm going to give you two verses for it. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And again, in Colossians 3.17, he said, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If we pray and we come before the Lord and we honestly can say, Your kingdom over mine. Your will over mine. If we will come to the Lord and say, God, use me today and all the things that I have in front of me, and the people I'm going to encounter, the relationships that I'm going to grow and foster, and the conversations that are coming, use me, Lord, today to do your work. You can trust that God will. You can trust that he will. He will use you. He will make every part of your life meaningful. Not from the perspective of your bank account or your friends or the people around you. Meaningful in God's eyes. That's where significance comes from. Next part of this prayer is found in verse 3, okay? Luke eleven three 3 says, Give us each day our daily bread, right? Give us each day our daily bread. Now, this is where we're used to prayer. This is where most of us begin. When we start having a conversation with God, we tell God the things that we need. We come before the Lord and we say, God, you know my needs, but I'm going to tell them to you anyway, and I'm going to tell you how to get it done, and when you should get it done by, and this is how it should look when it's finished. All right, now go. In the name of Jesus, amen. That's, that's where we're most comfortable, is in the giving over to God our needs. Right? Give us today what we need for today, Lord. We're asking for it. We're very comfortable with that. Let me tell you the, the background of this verse 3, this idea of the daily bread. Maybe you already know this, but it comes out of the Exodus generation, those who were called by God out of that place of slavery and bondage in Egypt, and as they left and entered into their time of preparation, God was preparing them, getting them ready for their future where they would go into the promised land. During that time, there were a lot of complaints and gripes. I can't imagine that, that uh, church people today would ever do something like that. And one of the complaints was, we're hungry, give us something to eat. And so God did. He gave them what was essentially like a, a seed that was, that was laid across the whole camp every morning on every surface like the dew that settles. And what did they call that? Anybody? Manna. Do you know where, what the word manna means? It's not awesome, spiritual, super wonderful. It means man who, all right? Those are the two words that are put together and it means what is that? <laughs> that is a fact, right? You look that up. That is a Hebrew language fact. You think, oh, the manna from heaven. It's like, no, 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 no. They looked at it and said, what the heck? We asked for bread and God gave us seeds. What are we supposed to do with this? Work. Take the provision that God provides. Use your own effort and create something with it of value. God was teaching them something. It wasn't about just providing food. God could have given them food in any different way. He was teaching them something, and he was teaching them that, that God is the provider of all things. But that the Lord doesn't want to just provide through miraculous means and get us into a place of dependency and need on the miraculous. Instead, God is wanting for us to be spiritual adults, to provide with our own hands, work for ourselves, take what God provides and make something out of it that is of benefit for ourselves and for those around us, and to do it daily. That's the, the message of the manna. That's the daily bread message. And it was there for the people to carry with them. Yes, and God, you know, you stopped the manna. The manna stopped coming. And there was a reason for that. And it's because God did not want his people to live in a place of dependency. 
But he wanted to teach them. The same thing we're being taught in this prayer is that when we come before the Lord, we acknowledge that God is the provider. He is the provider of all good things. And we take those things that God provides and we work them. We do our best with them. We work hard six days a week. Right, that's what that means. And we give God what belongs to the Lord. We give him praise, we give him glory, and it's all his. When we say daily bread, it's not just about here's my list of needs and wants, God, now go off, here's my shopping list, go get it done. We start by saying, Lord, you're the provider. And with your provision, you will help me provide for my family and for my church and for my community. Next part of this prayer says that we should approach God with an attitude of gratitude about forgiveness. So forgive us our sins. Now this is an interesting statement. Uh, it's, it's in the, all of these statements are in the imperative, which is a command, and it's this idea of coming before the Lord very boldly and saying to the Lord boldly, I, I need you to forgive my sins. Lord, you must forgive our sins. You, we, we don't have any other way. Lord, you must do it. There is no other approach. And so this is returning us to a place of gratitude as we think about our sins, our sinfulness, our brokenness in our nature. We recognize our need for God to provide forgiveness and we look to that provision. We look to the work that he's done through Jesus Christ. We look to the cross itself to understand how will he meet this need. It's a fascinating thing that Christians, especially today, struggle to understand what it means to truly be forgiven. And I hear it constantly. People don't understand that that all of your sin has been nailed to the cross with Christ. Not some of it, not just the little things, not just the stuff that you did before, but every bit of it. And I want to make this explicit. I want you to hear it from the way the Apostle Paul teaches this incredible teaching. It comes to us out of Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Paul says, when you, when we as believers in Jesus, when we were dead in our sins, okay, prior to our faith in Jesus, when we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us some of our sins, a few of our sins, just the, the ones that aren't so bad, No. He forgave us all our sins. All means all. Verse 14. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. What does that mean? How do you know whether or not you've committed a sin? There needs to be a standard out there, a law, a command that tells you what is from God and what is not from God. And Paul is saying that the law itself was nailed to the cross with Christ. All sin, including the thing that divides, the thing that helps us to see where sin begins and ends, all of it was nailed to the cross with Christ. And next he says, and he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, okay, that's both spiritual and physical, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So when we come before the Lord and we ask God, and we say to the Lord, forgive us our sins, we are saying two very powerful things. Number one, we're reminding ourselves that we are in need of forgiveness. Yes, it has all been nailed to the cross with Christ, but we need to recognize the areas of sin and failure that are consistently a part of our lives. We need to commit those things to Christ on a regular basis. You might be thinking, why? If it's all nailed to the cross, who cares? Just live how you want. Well, then obviously you don't know Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, you're going to love Jesus. And if you love Jesus, you're going to want to obey his commands. That's what he's taught us. That's the spirit of God in you that makes you hate sin and love righteousness. And if you think you can believe in Jesus and just live a life of sin, you don't know Jesus. You certainly don't know his love and you're not filled with it. When you're filled with his love, you want to honor him and you want to show him love. How do you show him love? By doing what he's asked of you. Model, do what he's done. And so the first thing we do is we recognize in ourselves that we are sinful and that we need forgiveness. We are in need of mercy. We're not perfect. The second thing that we do when we confess our need for this forgiveness 
is that we are saying that we understand that this is a gift. This is not from us. We're not the ones who died on the cross for our sins. Jesus did. We can't do anything about our indebtedness. Only Christ can. And so we look to him. We recognize that it's his work that has nailed sin to the cross. Now, how would you show God that you understand that you have been forgiven? How would you show God appreciation for the way that he has forgiven you? That's the next part of the prayer, is by showing a little bit of that mercy and grace to others. Forgive others. Now, I want us to understand this next part of this, this teaching, because in English it says we should forgive others the sin that they have committed against us. And in English, you have this interesting situation where, in English only, you have the same language being used to describe how God has forgiven you for your sins and how you, in turn, need to forgive others for their sins, all using forgive and sin as being equal to each other. But that's not the case in the, in the Greek. I want to show you this because I don't want you to just take my word for it. All right, so the first thing that we see is this Greek word of hamartia. All right, so there's two words here. When we say to the Lord, Lord, forgive us for our sin, we're saying, Lord, forgive us for our hamartia, for our acts of selfishness, unrighteousness, and rebellion. Those things that are reserved for our sin against, against the Lord. Okay, that's where that word gets used, is to describe sin against God. And so that's what we are asking for when we come to the Lord and we confess our need for his gift of forgiveness for our hamartia, for our sin. Then he turns around and says, and that we should go and forgive others for their what? Not hamartia, for their othello. Right, let's see if I'm saying that right. Oph, yeah, you try it. Ophelio, ophelio, we'll do that. This word is really about something that, that is a debt, right? This is someone who has done something or has taken something from you or has harmed you in some way that has cost you and now they are indebted to you. Okay, the reason I'm showing you these differences between when we come to the Lord, we're saying to the Lord, Lord, forgive me for my hamartia, for my unrighteousness. We need to see that only Jesus forgives sin. Right? Only Jesus forgives hamartia. Only Jesus can forgive rebellion against God. We, as much as we might love someone else, as much as we might want to forgive them for their sins, we don't have that ability. We don't have the ability to absolve someone of their sin, to take away the guilt of their crime. That's not up to us. That is only the purview of the Savior. That only belongs to Jesus. And we struggle with forgiveness. I think as believers, the more that you understand the way that God has forgiven you, and then you turn around and you hear that you should forgive others in that exact same way, you're like, that's too big, I can't do it. I don't know how to forgive someone for their sins. I don't know how to release them of, from the guilt that they owe. I don't know how to absolve them of their crime. And that's right, because you can't. That's impossible. This is where sometimes our, our, our translation doesn't do us justice, because if we could understand the differences between what we're being asked for, we would see that that this is not the same thing. We're not being asked to do the same thing. I want you to think about this idea of forgiving others as though, as though God had, is asking you. I want you to think about like if someone has given you an IOU, right? I have one here. It says IOU on it. This could be yours towards me. Who knows? Someone has done something to harm you, hurt you, damage you. I want you to think about that, what they have done to you as though they've given you a receipt, an IOU that someday they're going to come back to you and they're going to make recompense for that failure. They're going to do something to try to undo the damage they've done in their lies about you, their damage to you, their harm to you, whatever they've done that has hurt you. They've given you this receipt, and so you're holding on to this receipt expecting that one day they're going to come back and they're going to make things right with you. But long after they have forgotten about whatever it is that they've done to you, long after that whole situation doesn't exist on their side of the aisle, you're still the one left holding the receipt. You're still standing around waiting for the one who owes you to come back and make good on that debt. 
And so that's where we live in this state of unforgiven nature, where we stay in a place where we are harboring resentment against other people. We have an expectation that will never be fulfilled. And so what is Jesus saying? He's saying, get rid of the receipt. Let go of the IOU. Let go of your expectation that that other person is going to come to you and make things right. Because you know what? Whether they do or don't is not the problem. The problem is you're holding tight to their failure against you. You're not being asked to forgive their sin, their hamartia, in the same way that Jesus forgives your sin. You're being asked to let go of your expectation, let go of the receipt, get rid of the IOU, move on from that. Quit expecting them to do what's right. And when you do, you find freedom. Because I guarantee you, the longer that you live in a state where you are not willing to think about what it means to forgive, because in your mind, it looks like absolving them of the crime that they've committed against you, the pain that they've caused you. I get that. I don't want to do that for others because I recognize I can't do that for others. But when we learn that what Jesus is calling us to do is to let go of the debt that they owe us, you're going to find freedom. You're going to find great, great things from the Lord. Now we're going to look at the last line of this prayer. All right, it says, and lead us not into temptation. If you've been around a while in the church, uh, I've probably talked about this one thing. I've written about it several different times. We've preached about it over and over and over. If I could affect one change in the entirety of the biblical translation from Greek and Hebrew into English, it would be this one word. We translate this word in most modern English Bibles as temptation. The word we translate as temptation in Greek is periasmos. All right, perasmos, which is the time of trial and testing. It's used 59 times in the New Testament. And out of that 59 times, only four times in a modern English Bible do you find it ever being used as this word temptation. And two of them are from the prayers. One is from the conversation between Jesus and, and the accuser. And the other comes to us in the book of James where it says that God does not tempt and cannot be tempted. Out of that 59 times, every other time that word is used, it's used to describe something like a trial that you get put into, a, a time of challenge that is meant to push you, to refine you, and to actually bring God glory through your time of struggle, not to potentially lead to sin and rebellion. Now, for, maybe you don't stress about these kind of things. I, I read this and it's, it drives me bonkers because the reason why we still translate it as temptation is because biblical translators are just people. And they have a hard time changing tradition. All right, the tradition that was given out in 1611, not in the original, right, but in the, in the 1611 King James Bible, they used this word temptation. It was based off of an old French word that means a tempest or a storm. Okay, that's what it means. And even in English, it doesn't mean what you think it means. And the reason why this word keeps getting used this way and provides a lot of weird thoughts and a lot of weird reactions, when you read this prayer and you think, well, hang on, hang on. I'm supposed to pray that God doesn't lead me into temptation, but over here in James uh, chapter one, it says that, that God does not lead anyone into temptation. Well, which one is true? Obviously, the Bible's false to throw it all, the whole thing out. No. It's because Bible translators know that if they translate this, if they take the courage and to say, God, lead us not into the time of testing and trial, the church is going to explode and scream and yell at them and tell them, how dare you? How dare you change the Lord's prayer? We've had it this way since the beginning. Since the, Jesus said it this way. Did he? I think it's important for us to acknowledge that when we are talking about translation, we're talking about people. And people do their best. But people can be swayed by, I don't know, losing your job. Not being invited to be a part of the next translation. All right, getting kicked out of your seminary professor job because you did the wrong thing. This should be read. It should be read as, an, as lead us not into the time of trial. Lead us not into times of struggle, 
times of challenge. I'll give you an example of exactly how you should read it. Okay? This is one of the other 59 times where it's used, and it's used in the same context. And in this case, it's the exact same word, the exact same form of that word. So there's no difference, and it's even used in the same exact concept. All right? So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. It says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to, uh, for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of parasmas, all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which per- perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So here we see that the, this same concept, the church is facing a time of what? A time of trial, a time of testing, a time of difficulty and challenge. And the result of that challenge, the thing that comes to them at the end of it, is not sin, it's not rebellion against God, but it's proving, it says it proves and improves their faith. And it leads to the praise of God, glorifying God, honoring God, the time of testing and trial is there for the good of the church. And it's not leading them to the place of temptation to sin. You might think, Ryan, you make too much of this. You you protest too much. I think this stuff matters. I think it, it has caused a lot of people that I've talked to over the years to really struggle to understand how, how should I approach God in times of struggle, in times of challenge and hardship? I've got one more thing I want to say on this, okay? One more last thought. And that last thought is if, and this is a big if, right? Every one of these is a big if. If you have an interest in having a relationship with God like the one that Jesus had. If you are interested in having a mature and growing, spiritually adult-like faith in Christ, You need to come before him in an attitude of prayer and openness, communication to God. And if you will approach God and you will acknowledge him and praise him before you do all other things, before you focus on today, you give God praise, the eternal one praise. If you will come before the Lord and say, hallowed is your name, great are you. You are separate and holy, but yet you draw me into your presence through the work of Jesus. If You will come to the Lord and say to God, God, your kingdom come, not mine. Lord, use the works of my hands. Lord, use my stuff, my relationships, my work. Use my education. Use my relationships in all different levels of life. Use them for your glory, for your praise, and for your honor. If we will come before the Lord and we will acknowledge that God is the giver of all good things and that we are not the source of that incredible blessing, but God gives us what we need so that we can go out and produce and bring him glory with the works of our hands. If we will give God thanks for the work of the cross as he's taken away the shame and the penalty of our sin, if we will come to the Lord and say, God, give me the ability through the work of your spirit to show a small portion of that grace and mercy to others as I let go of my expectations of them. If you do those things, I'm 95% certain that you're not ever going to need to be put through the test. You don't need to enter into times of challenge and trial because your heart won't be hard. You don't need your heart broken up if you're constantly coming before the Lord and acknowledging him in all of your ways. If you're seeking him in good times and bad and you're seeking his righteousness over all other things, you're probably not going to have to sit around and wonder about, God, please don't take me into the time of trial and hardship. At least that's been my experience. The times where God has put me through the ringer, has knocked me down, has put me on my knees, it's because my heart was hard towards him and I wasn't paying attention. I didn't care. I cared about myself more than I cared about him. And if you pray this prayer the way Jesus gives it to you, you will not enter that place of hardness you will be in a place where you are ready to be used by God at the moment's notice. But, if, if you refuse to give God praise in your daily life, if you refuse to allow God to use your stuff, your relationships, your work, and your people 
to bring himself glory to build his kingdom. If you believe that you are the source of the goodness and blessing in your life, it was by my hands and by my work that all of this was laid. If you don't see that you're desperately in need of a savior because of your sin, if you don't see the need to show mercy and grace to those around you because of the mercy and grace you've been shown by Christ, then brother and sister, you better get ready because there's a trial coming. When you're in that place, when your heart is hard and you have turned away from the Lord, God will get your attention. He will move heaven and earth. He will drive you to your knees. He'll do whatever it takes until you relent. You don't want that. If you do, there's something really wrong with you. None of us want that. So instead of worrying about the future hardship and trial that you're going to face, why don't you start today by acknowledging his goodness, confessing your sin, being open to let him work through you. Be open-handed to the Lord. Be soft-hearted with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this opportunity this morning right now to come and take this message and make it real in our lives. Lord, we thank you that your spirit at work in us right now is taking your word, Lord, and it's making it real and applying it into every part of our lives. Lord, where we are hard-hearted, Lord, we confess that and we seek to repent, turn away from that. Lord, we do that by acknowledging you. You are worthy. You are the only one. Hallowed be your name. Lord, we confess that we need you at work in us, building your kingdom, making yourself known. Lord, providing eternal quality and purpose to our everyday lives, and we do that by submitting ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. God, every part of us is yours. Our money, our relationships, our bodies, our, our future, it's all in your hands. Lord, we confess that you are the provider, you are the giver of all good things. Whatever, whatever we are using in this life to provide and produce and to make a good life, God, we give you praise for it. It is from you and it is for you. Lord, we thank you for the work that you have done on the cross for us in the name of Jesus. Lord, you have set us free. Lord, we ask that you would help us to let go Lord, let go of the pain and the hurt that others have brought into our lives. Lord, release them of that expectation. God, we forgive. We freely, we let go of that receipt. We give you the IOU. We ask for freedom and forgiveness. And Lord, we just, again, we come before you and we give you thanks that you have, in your grace, in your love for us, you tell us exactly what you want from us, exactly what it is that you have done for us and exactly what we can expect in your eternal future. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving us in a place of doubt and wonder, but for giving us your truth. We praise you in always. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.